Hello, I'm Blade BlademoQuest and I'm bringing you another Black Desert Online video. Yes, we still have a few of those to get through on the YouTube channel for sure. And this is actually going to be part of the Blade Edge Peak Performance Consulting series. Yeah, nice, nice mouthful of a name, right? So if you guys remember Bum to Billionaire, it was a highly viewed series back in 2016, 2017, just in the beginning of 2017, where I took my subscribers, we did raffles, and I basically coached them over three sessions, essentially, about an hour each session. We took them from bum to billionaire, wherever they started off, to get them towards their goals. Well, after the wagon reveal, I decided that I would start doing some coaching again for Black Desert Online. And it's something that I really just didn't want to do. I stopped doing it in early 2017. I didn't do it at all in 2018. And then in the middle of 2019, I decided all right, let me try to get back into it. This has been really highly requested. It was a pretty expensive program and uh, people were, were all about it. But I don't want to be a consultant. I want to be a streamer. I want to be a live streamer and I would like to be a guide maker. And so it was actually taking up a lot of my time to look at the markets right before our sessions and analyze their exact situation, go through the time with them and then follow up to make sure I'm not missing any opportunities even on the higher level than I would typically have for myself because I want to make sure I'm delivering a really good service to these guys that are paying for it. And, uh, and honestly, like for every hour that I charged for, it probably took three hours, if not more. And so basically my whole like month was kind of eaten up as a consulting, not firm, right? But a, as a consultant and it's just not what I wanted to do. So I discontinued it about as fast as I started it and uh, it never quite made it to YouTube where you guys had the opportunity to do it. The good news is though, we have seven recorded sessions. So uh, three different people went through it and I have these recordings. So I gave them six months of using these uh, materials and different things like that that they had back then. And I, they always knew it was going to YouTube. That was part of the original agreement. So I gave them six months. I just told them I'd give them like two months or so. They have six months to use all of that stuff. And now you guys get to see exactly what I told each one of these, these people. Just consider it like uh, the blade edge coaching, right? You don't have to worry about it being bummed a billionaire or peak performance consulting. We refer to it as the blade edge coaching for Black Desert. And uh, it's not, oriented around being a guide. It's pretty long winded. These are about an hour long and there's a lot of pauses and stuff as I'm listening and hearing exactly where, what their situations are. And then we're analyzing the market, both stuff that I did before these sessions and in real time. And it should be fairly helpful for people that are still trying to get ahead in Black Desert Online on PC, Black Desert for sure on Xbox and PS4 and most likely there will be some comparisons over to Black Desert Mobile, though these are not tailored specifically towards Black Desert Mobile. All right, guys, hope you enjoy this coaching session. It is going to be one of seven hitting this channel. All right, good stuff. Cool. So let me pull up your file here. How's it going? It's pretty good. Very good, very good. This new adventure. Yeah, yeah, actually I'm pretty impressed with what I'm looking at here. I think you're probably the most well-established player I've ever worked with. So that should be encouraging. That's really good. It means you're definitely not too far off, not nearly as far off as you might think. So you're a witch, you've got both PvE, PvP gear, and you said you're mainly grinding out of Aukman right now, right? Yeah, because I don't really do party at Miramont. Okay. So when I do grind, that I feel like it's better for my time instead of trying to rely on others. Mm -hmm. So me being able to just venture off to Auckland on my own will allow me to just make gain. If I'm not grinding in Auckland, I'm pretty much just setting up on my life skills, which right. usually my my daily routine is tend to my farm whenever there are resets, and then do my daily imperial, and then run to comma Sylvia and then do the dailies for that and then go about whatever I need to do for the rest of the day. What dailies are you running in Camasilf? Pretty much just the the leaves so I can get the the T9 mass so I had to sell in the market. Okay. Uh, there's a daily down there where you can make one Margoria special and then it gives you an advanced cooking utensil. I don't know if you're aware. 
I think that's tied to fishing, which I'm still trying to work on. Okay. So I need to get that, so that would help out a lot too. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm not too much one for dailies or questing, but if you're going to do the dailies and questing in general, out of Camisil, that's a good one to tack on. Uh, all right, cool. So you should be expecting, if you did do a five-man Miramok grind with the AP that you have, generally, generally you're looking at something around 50 million an hour. It's really become quite solid. So your Aukman rates solo without a loot scroll, what are you seeing generally in the 40s or is it comparable to that sometimes hard to say just because i've been using my loot scroll since i have around 150. oh yeah there you go so i figured might as well just burn it while i'm there sure i know um i haven't tested with the new buff but when i was doing top rotation i was getting close to 6100 loot per hour so that's pretty good for my current AP. Yeah, I yeah, I there you go. I'm having issues, but I was doing, uh, normally, since obviously the top rotation is usually pretty, pretty packed, I normally do the, the elite rotation that Jackie Felix usually does. And I get probably 5,200 loot per hour there. So cool. Yeah, I mean, a grind like that, I don't think you need to change, to be honest, in terms of like where to grind. So you've got that on lockdown. Let's talk about your farming a little bit. So I see that your your main here doesn't have a farming level, so everything is offloaded to an alt. Um, it looks like from the turn-ins, you're, you're farming up north by Velia, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and you have 10 by 10 farms. That's definitely a good way to go. What are you farming right now? Um, I'm just doing magic a week, and then I just sell the excess of that and then whenever I have enough fruit of the sun which I tend to get a lot I just craft the oils into that and then I'll make the elixirs and then I either sell them in the market or I'll just use those for imperial or personal use all right that's a pretty good system so if you do end up making the oils and making the elixirs from there um, those would go into I believe it's perforation elixirs uh, you would never really want to sell the elixir just on its own you would want to convert that into drafts do you have a lot of experience with drafts or, or not as much um not really and okay just from looking at the giant draft it mm -hmm. kind of looks a little more frightening of the fact that it feels like i might not make as much money off of that compared to doing the beast draft but i haven't really ran the numbers on it it just seems like a giant draft right now it seems to kind of sink down while the beast Okay, so drafts are incredibly profitable, as are cron meals. So today I really want to focus on on alchemy and drafts specifically. So if you're not seeing, if you haven't done that a lot, and if you're not seeing the profit right there, that's something that I want to open your eyes to because it's actually pretty amazing. So with uh, with wheat, that's going to give you fruit of the sun, as you know. Now you're not going to be able to make the beast drafts unless you have the fruit of nature, which comes from the purple mushrooms. So as long as you have any of the wheat that you're, are you specifically making that for Fruit of the Sun? Because that's an unusual crop to use unless you specifically need those fruits. Um, because I either make the Elixir Carnage, okay. which I typically use for my personal game, but I have so much to where it's tens of hours of grinding because I've converted it to party Elixir. Right. So now I have a lot of Fruit of the Sun that I could be using if I wanted to make giant. I see, so that's personal use kind of thing. I gotcha. Okay, so Carnage is gonna use... Yeah, it overall, a that's a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't made those in quite a while. But they're pretty effective to use. All right, so uh, you're obviously in game right now, right? Sure. All right, so if you open up the market, let's just, let's go through the Giants draft numbers right now. So search for draft, we'll look at Giants. So Giants, they are gonna fluctuate a little bit, but that's kind of, that's fine, that's important to know because other people that don't know the profit margins that aren't good at going through the math, whenever they see the price falls 50K or something, they just like don't touch and they often don't look at it again. But really at 505K right now, this is something that's worth our time. So let me grab the calculator. So we have 505k. You have under 4,000 family fame, so you're gonna be taxed 84. You're gonna get 84.5% back from taxes. 
Are you aware that um, at 4,000 family fame and 7,000 family fame, you get tax less? I heard about that. I haven't really looked at the actual family fame numbers on how much it changes as it goes up now. Okay, so you basically get 1% back. It's quite good. So if you can get 4,000 family fame, then you're going to start getting 85.5% back. And 1% from all of the market sales from then on is a really good thing to have. So it's definitely worth your time. You might want to think about, since you said you're going to be playing the game for quite a while, you might want to think about getting a couple more 60s, maybe using the turn-ins to level up cooking and alchemy and processing on your alts, uh, stuff like that. I had a bunch of my alts basically just process flax and get them all up to professional one. Uh, but either way, so right now we're going to multiply that by 0 0.845. So you don't have to have a calculator in front of you, I'll just talk out the numbers so you know what we got. That means we're going to get 426,000 silver uh, after taxes. So there's a lot of things to deduct, like you said, it looks a little intimidating making these drafts. So the first thing to, to deduct is 100k, which is the Tears of Falling Moon. Uh, that's just something that you buy in order to make the draft in the first place. And you need three of three different kinds of elixirs. So let's uh, let's look at Fury and Shock. Now both these should be about 15k a piece, I believe. Yeah, it looks like it. Now making Fury elixirs really isn't that worthwhile. It's going to be less silver than just gathering. It's going to be less silver than uh, grinding. It's going to be less silver than other kinds of alchemy and other types of cooking. So generally, this is not something that you would want to make yourself. This would be something that you would buy yourself. Now, if Fury Elixirs get, you know, well into the mid 20,000s or something like that, and you see uh, Troll, Bear, Lion, or Ogre Blood down in the 4 or 5k range, then it would be much more worthwhile to produce your own Furies. But with the current prices that we see, Furies at like 15, 16k, it actually just makes sense to buy those. So what we'll do is deduct uh, our remaining silver, which is 326k, uh, by 45k. Cost of Furies, and let's look at Shock Elixir. Uh, let me actually double check the Cedar price real quick as well. Cedar price, it's 3, 4k. That's not too bad. So Shock Elixirs, again, it'd be fine. It'd be fine to make these, it'd be fine to buy these. But in general, it's just going to save you some time to just pick these up and buy them. So if we deduct the cost by another 45k, we're, le we're left with 236 thousand silver not including the perforation elixirs so let me search perforation elixir and we see a couple interesting things here so the blues are actually selling at uh 200k or 205k and three green make up a blue so i'm not sure if you you knew that, right? With drafts, you could use three green or one blue, okay. So it doesn't actually say that anywhere, but that is how that works. So what this means is, basically, the silver you get back from buying these other components, you don't have to do any alchemy, you're just buying them and you'd be making the drafts. It would value the perforation elixir at 236K. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. Now what that tells us is, say instead of doing that, you're selling the perforations, right? So we'll just say, if you would be selling, um, we'll use the higher price, so three greens would sell at 75k a piece, 75 times three, so you're at 225k. Uh, then we'd multiply that by the tax, so 0.845%. So if you would sell the green perforations that you make yourself, you're receiving 190k. Whereas if you buy the other ingredients right off of the market and then you turn those into drafts, then every three green perforations that you get are valued at 246k. Makes sense. 236. Right, so that's a difference of 46k per, you know, three perforations. And considering it takes you, what, one second to make a batch of alchemy, one or two seconds, depending on what your buffs are, and you can be making these drafts largely AFK, this is a way to expand on your profit greatly rather than just take the elixirs to the marketplace. So next time you go through that and you're making those oils and you're making those perforation elixirs, just remember, just buy the other components and just turn them into drafts and you're gonna be making a lot more money.
So then just focus on perforation and then just buy everything else. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, perforation is a really good one. Easy enough then. Yep, so that'll help you with your farming. Now, if you decide to change your farming, um, are you are you aware of the fastest crop in the game if you want T9 mats? I saw your video in regards to that. Cool, okay. There you go. Yeah, so purple mushrooms are Dalvinia alria. That's going to have a cycle time of about two and a half hours, whereas wheat will be capped at about three and a half hours. So if you decide that you basically want to focus more on T9 mats, and there's quite a bit of money out of that, you know, you can you can go to a faster cycle crop, which would be purple mushrooms or Del Delvinia alria. That would give you a fruit of nature, and you can do the same thing, except that would take through through beast drafts instead of giant drafts. I wouldn't mind doing the T9 cap. I just mm -hmm. I'm incapable of logging into the game when I'm not at home. Okay. Just to get my cell service. Right, and that's a very fast cycle time. You know, every two and a half hours, that's that's a large portion of your day. I mean, that's checking out at four times a day, probably for 10 to 15 minutes, and in the course of 10 hours. So if you're working, you know, that doesn't really become an option. But just wanted to give you an alternative there. All right, so I don't know if um, this caught your eye at all, but because there's a difference and discrepancy between the value of drafts versus how much your drafts, I'm sorry, because there's a difference in price discrepancy between the perforation elixirs versus how much a perforation elixir is worth if you're selling the draft, what that means is you can actually buy all of the components straight off of the market and turn a profit. Now, have you ever tried building drafts AFK for profit? I have not. Probably not, right? All right, so there's a really cool way that this can actually work. So I want to do the math one more time just to not only double check it, but to walk you through it one more time. So we have 505K multiplied by 0 0.845. That gives us back 426,000. We're going to subtract the 100,000 cost of the Tears of the Falling Moon to turn these drafts into beasts or giants in the first place and then we're going to subtract 45k for the shock price just buying those off the market subtract another 45k for the furies just buying those off of the market now since blue count is three green and uh let's see so these blues are actually a little bit higher than two of five like it said there so that's a 20 it's like yeah about 220k 220k is going to be the final thing we subtract. Now, what that does is if we buy everything straight off the market, every time we make one draft, we're getting 16,000 silver. The reason this is significant, because I don't know, does that sound like a lot to you or does not sound like a lot? Well, I know it can add up over time. <laughs> right. I mean, even though it's in the positive realm, it's, you're, you're making it. Sure. Just wanted to see, like, what you were looking at number wise okay so the reason this is a lot is because you can make 10 traps at a time so multiply that by 10 now we're looking at 167,000 profit so while it looks like you have a razor thin margin of 16k per draft buying everything straight off the market you actually have that times 10 if you buy something called an ilbab oasis tier or something stupid like that and that only costs 10k and it allows you you buy it you buy it once and it makes 10 drafts at one time. So our profit goes from 16.7k to 167k per batch of creating drafts. And we're going to subtract our 10k from the Ilbab Oasis thing. And that means we now have 157,000 profit every time we combine these drafts. Now that can actually happen quite a few times. Uh, let's say, I think it's about every six seconds, right? But there's a chance of failing. So rather than just say we'll do this 10 times a minute, on the safe side, probably like seven or eight times a minute. Multiply that by eight, we're looking at over a million per minute. <laughs> Multiply that by 60, and we're looking at 75 million in an hour AFK. It is. It is a lot. And these are the kinds of things that people just don't really look at because the margins will appear and then a couple people will do them and then they won't be there for yet another couple weeks or something like that. But what you should get in the habit of doing is just quickly going through this kind of math on different drafts 
uh, because you can make them at a factor of 10. And then it makes sense to just buy whatever you can right off the market and create them. Like right now, I mean, let's see what, there's still 462 brutal perforations. That would be worth your time to buy. You know, we did the math up to 220K, they're between 218 and 223. If you bought all 462 of those right now and then bought the corresponding shock and fury elixirs with the tears of the falling moon and just did that AFK even while we talk, even though it wouldn't take a full hour, you would be making on average 75 million an hour after those are done. It's like pretty insane to think about. Isn't it? Yeah, hopefully this coaching is worth it for you. I know there's a pretty expensive price on it, but this is exactly what we want to get you to start looking at. Yeah, because when oh. I first looked at the Draftsman sets, it just looked like you're overspending mm -hmm. for the, the quantity, and then you look at other stuff, and then you hear other people's insights of you don't just factor in the resources, you got to factor in everything that crashed into it, so it's kind of overwhelming. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, this is just nothing but good news, because especially this is if that profit is just from straight buying everything in the market, obviously, if you're getting your own fruits of the sun, you're making your own oil of corruption, you're making your own per perforation, this just becomes an extremely profitable system at this point. So, you know, 75 million was just assuming that you paid somebody else to buy all that stuff. But if you're taking up three steps of crafting and you're farming it, this is gonna be one of the best sources of income that you have access to, even better than grinding or gathering right now. Okay, cool, so I wanted to explain that. Um, now, verter drafts, I've already done the math just right before our session here. There's no real reason to do it again with you. It's the same as the other drafts, but verter drafts are not worth your time to make. So when you need them, obviously, for cooking or alchemy, rather than making them yourself, which would be a negative profit per hour, you would just straight up buy them just buy those guys but right now beast and giant drafts are both profitable to make through just buying everything on the market so just real quick if we look at the beast they require will xp and uh, i think it's grim reaper yeah will xp and grim reaper so will for example there are 322 blue will elixirs on the market um, the green are 26k a piece. So if you had to buy three green, that's going to be 75 to 80k, whereas the blue are only 62k. That's going to build in an extra factor of 20k profit per draft that you would make. Um, I've already done the math. I can just tell you this is another very good one. So if you buy all of those wills and you buy the, uh, the corresponding elixirs of, what is it? I think XP xp and grim reaper if you're just buying those you're going to be making a similar kind of profit to the tune of around 50 mil an hour so that's how the math is done on these drafts it's just something to do maybe every couple of weeks because you might be getting an astronomical amount of profit Alrighty, moving on uh i want to go over more of what i'm seeing just in your banks and your systems i've got some questions for you um, so you have 10,000 logs here. What what are you doing? What are your plans with these um, guys? So I used to make a lot of advanced utensils. Okay. And then I upgraded a lot of my, my cooking and my alchemy speed. So now mm -hmm. I'm kind of just stuck with that. Okay. So now I could use the 100 durability from the shop. Right. That's what I, I do too. Mm -hmm. Now I just have an overboard, and so I just was maybe just thinking of just converting it and then just making utensils and then just selling them on the market just so I just get rid of it. I don't really know. Yeah, that's not too bad. Uh, let me actually let me look at the prices with you there. So I'm going to go over to Glish here and just take a look at these tools to make sure that it makes sense to produce those. Because so last time I looked at producing uh, these alchemy and cooking stations was a long time ago. So if you mouse over it and you hit control and then left click, it'll bring up the actual individual item and you can mouse over each individual uh, component. I don't know if you've done that before or not. Have you tried that or not as much? Uh, I would forget that it's control. Yeah, it's so useful, I love it. 
So we're looking at, let's see, polished stone, 17K times 20, scantling, five times 25K, and then 20 iron shards, about 2K a piece with blackstone powder. Blackstone powder is tanked quite a bit. So advanced cooking utensils are one mil. Let me just make sure that price is correct. Yeah, one mil 20K. So how long have you played exactly? Because this really, you do have a very impressive empire. Um, my witch literally just started. Oh, really? Um, you had 200 days on somebody. So next month in July will be my witch's first year mark. So oh, wow. Okay. Cool. And I started, I think, late April. And I was kind of just toying around. And then that's when I started just main witch and then I just stayed witch from this entire time and then built up this entire empire in a year. In one year. Dude, that's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. I looked All at right. a bunch of other people. I looked at mm -hmm. your stuff. I mean, your stuff was kind of, it looked old, but I mean, looking at all the current stuff, it just seemed relevant. Yeah, it's the same deal, more or less. And then just looking at other people's notes set up and just kind of depending on how I'm my, my play style I always tell a lot of people you can't just copy someone's no network and expect to get anything out of it because if you don't use anything you're kind of wasting your resources yeah I agree with that but then you can, but then you can look at my storage and I have like <laughs> hundreds of thousands of stuff so. that's okay I mean that's good so yeah you want to basically keep on accumulating that until you go through it in batches so I just did the math here on these advanced cooking utensils looks like each one that you're gonna make uh, if you're valuing the components at their market value you're gonna be making over 300k so honestly with logs there aren't a whole lot of fantastic uses outside of cool ship stuff so if you take them through advanced utensils just to sell I think that would be a fine fine source so are you still actively gathering though that's what I'm wondering if this was like just a result of just gathering non-stop or if you were trying to build a boat or something um, I already have a boat and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to bring it or not <laughs> I have the glue and all that stuff just pending and I have my right I saw blue, blue whale pendant waiting just to see if I really curious if I wanted that boat or not. Well, do you do sea monster hunting? I used to. Now I'm in a guild where it's just pretty chill relax, so. Right. But well, it definitely. It's going to change, so. Yeah. Wait, you said it will or won't change? It, it just depends. Because, I mean, if it changes where I end up going sea monster hunting, then I would probably have to go with frigate. Sailing, actually, like the inferior sailing boat doesn't do that badly. The frigate is absolutely better, but uh, with enhanced gear, your sailboat can actually go faster than the frigate for whatever reason. And but mostly it's for storage capacity for trading. So sea monster running is still the best silver per hour that you can get outside of insane wagging and wagon investing or something. Um, but you know, I wouldn't say sacrifice your friendship or anything just to get that extra. So I'm with you on that. I ended up getting a sailboat and not a frigate. Okay, so that explains the logs. What kind of gathering are you doing nowadays when you're not farming and not grinding? Um, I guess it really just depends. So I either do like bloods. Oh, really? Um, if I need to do any of my extra imperial trading, I'll do. I, I buy a lot of the, the bottled water and all that stuff so I can just Good. Get filter throughout the entire time just because I. I can make more. Oh, you do filter the water. And then I can just gather a bunch of the, the wild herbs, stuff and bear. And then I usually just make all my my main resources for all that. You're making your own reagents? I do. Yeah. Uh, at this point, yeah, the prices are are suitable right, to, to manufacturing. Ago, but I kind of just had so much just because I was parlor my alchemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll happen for sure. The market is kind of volatile. Like it was only looks like a week ago they were sitting for about 2,000 each. 
So if you see reagents pretty much under 3000, it's generally more worthwhile for your time just to straight up buying them. That'll just free up your time to make more advanced elixirs or to gather or to grind or farm or something like that. But with them being over 3k, I think, you know, that's fine. And it's good alchemy XP anyway. Yeah. So let's see, Alta Nova. Uh, got a pretty big bank there. You got 80 inventory slots, 10 mil. Now with Tariff, you have, looks like Tariff is connected to the Maple node by Heidel. Is that correct? So I'm seeing yeah, Tariff so kind of go across. I have Tariff connected to Soldiers mm -hmm. just because I have an Artisan Worker and I don't have enough Artisan Workers at Old Nova yet to kind of work at Omar Lava Cave for the C variant. So I kind of just have a Tariff Worker at the moment just slowly working on some things. I got you. Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, it's just one extra contribution. It's not too big of a deal. Do you have all of the pearl lodging unlocked? I do. Good. Okay. Now, do you know how to get more lodging by getting uh, the lodging in neighboring towns that are not actually within the city limits? Have you heard of that before? Yeah, because my belly is 11 out of 11, so it's pretty capped out. Yeah, that should be your limit there. Uh, yeah, I have 11, 11. Okay, so then, yeah. In Toss Candy Farm, for example, there's lodging, so you know about getting that to expand your workers. Cool. For me, I think right now, I kind of revamped a little bit of my empire, so now I'm just sitting on a lot of workers that aren't doing anything. I do that too. Yeah, I think that's and fine. I just don't know if I'm just wasting CP just having lodging, and I don't have anything connected. Because I, I, I want workshops, but I don't, I don't know what to revamp. Mm -hmm. And then also me wanting to do workshops. I don't have that many workers that are even plus three. So it's kind of like I don't even know if it's worth to do workshops if I don't have plus three. Practice. It's still worth it. Yeah, like there are some workshops that are quite profitable that are just you can't even get a plus three. Things like horseshoes, for example. Uh, which is one of the workshops I would suggest you start picking up. Maybe in Calpheon should have some of the most CP efficient workshops. So if you just even start with that, that would make sense. My typical suggestion is somewhere between two and five workshops with a node empire. But when you're doing 10 farms, that kind of replaces the CP that's really necessary for building workshops. So you already have 10 farms. You have a pretty good node empire. We're going to tweak it a little bit here. And if you just add in just like a single workshop, that'll just constantly be manufacturing. And then as that worker goes along, you can kind of re-roll his skills and stuff like that. Uh, so you have one worker out there in the Opal node by Sangrain Bazaar. What kind of worker is that? Uh, you're talking about the explosion? Yeah. professional at the moment i'm still trying to get them up to artisan okay so let's see what is his cycle time then he probably has the work speed to do it right or yeah what is his cycle time it's like for him being professional it's 22 minute cycle hmm. okay not bad but not good enough we can we can do something kind of cool there so would you believe that i have an artisan giant that does this in less than 15 minutes i mean i will believe i have some giants i mean a lot of them have insane movement speed i don't really have the work speed but i could definitely see once you start resetting skills on giants they start becoming monsters mm -hmm. on some work, work mode, so. do you know how the workload and work speed things correlate between nodes and workers pretty complicated so i'd be impressed if you did too much movement speed to where it really doesn't matter. The points to where you almost want to more focus on work speed versus movement. So I don't really know the math and all that stuff. Okay. So it's pretty interesting. Basically, the more players in the server that have that node, the higher the workload moves. 
So the workload of the node will actually increase or decrease based off of the number of people that are trying to get it. And your actual work speed of the uh, worker, so their work speed, not their movement speed, is what determines how many trips to the node they take. It's really quite bizarre and quite interesting. So if we look at, uh, let's say, uh, well, let's just use the Capotio node as an example. So both you and I have that invested right now, which means we can't see its current workload, but ballpark, it would probably be somewhere around 100 or 99 or something like that. So if you have a worker with a work speed that is anything under the workload, the worker goes all the way to the node, it harvests from it, and then it runs all the way back to the bank again. And then it runs all the way back to the node, and then it runs back to the bank again. So it will make two trips out there if its work speed is even 0.01 below the workload of the node. So the way to greatly increase the efficiency of your node empire is to make sure that you have specific workers that have a higher work speed than the workload of the node that you're putting them on. Makes sense. Pretty crazy, right? But moving speed is kind of almost irrelevant. Yeah, it's not that important. I mean, it's okay in the sense of like going from Alta Nova up to like White, white Cedar, the top of Madaya or something. It definitely makes it a little faster. But the key is having a work, work speed that's higher than the workload. So for me with this Artisan Giant, since its workload is around a uh, little over 100, uh, it can do this in one cycle. So it runs out there, it's done in one trip, handles the whole workload, and then it runs back. So even being a really slow giant, having a node like this that cycles like every 12 to 15 minutes is a crazy income producer, as you can imagine. And then with the uh, 35 stamina, it just lasts so much longer. So the best worker ability for these nodes is farm knowledge. So that actually has a node work speed plus five. And that works on any kind of gathering node. That just means as long as you're not manufacturing, if it's a gathering node of any kind, farm knowledge gives it plus five work speed to that node. Yeah, I have a few workers that have it. It just feels like it's very rare to get. Yeah, it is a rare one. And I unfortunately re-rolled a bunch of those guys when I got them in the early days before I knew what it did. Uh, but that's one thing to keep in mind. So you want to start like just maybe canceling your workers or something, not in the morning, but instead of canceling them, just in the morning before you feed them all again, double check if you can level up any of them, uh, but not just promote them, but re-roll the skills. Have you been re-rolling many skills? Um, majority of all my areas mm -hmm. pretty much re-rolled. I try to re-roll as much as I cool. can on a daily basis. When it's tough. And I, I rarely stay on top of it, but as long as you're aware of it and you know how that works, that's the important thing. So that's really good. Cool, so that's a little bit on nodes. Uh, we'll tweak your empire a little bit later, but just more on gathering. So you're gathering the bloods in order to make alchemy for your imperials and things like that. So very, very soon, gathering is gonna be our top income, basically. It's gonna surpass the grinders out there in the underwater area. It's gonna be completely insane with Manos. And so your timetable for playing this game was a long time, right? If you said you would be playing three to six months, I wouldn't really recommend this. But since you're going to be playing quite a bit, I would say you probably want to start leveling up the gathering level of all of your characters. Okay. So the reason this is so important is because as your gathering level moves up, you consume the durability of your lucky and magic tools less frequently but also you consume energy less frequently. So what most players do that, aren't, that don't have a very long-term strategy is they will buy energy potions and they will convert 200 energy into 50 energy. Have you found yourself doing that? Yeah, I tend to just cycle my ults to see that from energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a bad way to go and it definitely gets the job done, but ultimately you're always losing you know, 150 energy there. And the way that works is because if you have one character that's so leveled up in gathering, you so infrequently use energy that 50 energy feels like 200 energy. So you have like this short-term gain where it makes sense for, you know, 
maybe a, a three a two or three month time period but if you would commit the time and level up your alts then you never have to take that energy loss so in the future when we have manos dude it's just going to be so crazy like even right now if you're just chopping down trees or if you're out there mining you can expect to get something like enough dust to produce 10 to 15 kafirs an hour and if you're getting 10 to 15 kafirs an hour i mean right there you're looking at over 30 million plus you have your sharps and hards and on top of that you have your raw materials if you do something like fluid extractors and you go and grab Thuja Sap. I don't know if you've looked at this on the market. It's T H U. Right now, the Thuja rotation is not mm -hmm. awful, but I know that once we get that new upgrade, that rotation will compensate. So it should be a lot better, especially the bird. The bird is definitely atrocious to try to gather as well. Right. Yeah, it's not my favorite thing to do either. But if you're just looking at like the just the base mats alone are 20k you know even if you get something like 2k or something in an hour that right there you're looking at what 30 mil from kafris who knows how many million from sharps and hards your base mats can be up there between 20 and 40 million so it puts gathering at one of the top income forms probably even above Achman grinding or at least right at it and then whenever Manos comes out, the mastery is just going to allow us to get a higher percent chance on all the rare proc rates. All the base mats are going to increase. And that's the time when you're gonna to wanna to have all of your energy available on all of your characters. So do you just AFK gathering bottles or what do you, what do you, you do could. So the way you'd want to level up your alts for gathering would basically be going out to Pilgrim's Haven. So after skilled five, you can start to get the rare gems. And even as a low level gatherer, you're still getting that top silver per hour rate. It's just you won't be able to get it as long because you run out of energy faster at a low gathering level. But still like silver per hour, it's a fantastic way to spend your time. So just putting your alts out there at Pilgrim's Haven, gathering only with lucky, pickaxes uh, either steel shining or magic any of those that's going to be one of your top silver income rates and it'll prepare you for the future when manos comes out do you know how gathering xp is calculated kind of weird from, from what i gathered it based off of the, the proc of the quantity that you get which is I, why kind of like pilgrim haven and like bear riverhead tends to get a lot of XP. Um, kind of. That's actually how I thought it worked as well. It seems pretty intuitive. Rather than the quantity of the items, it's each different type of item you get has its own XP. So it actually doesn't matter if you get one or four of them. If you get that item at all, like if you get one rough stone or four rough stone, it's worth the same amount of XP. So the way to maximize your gathering XP is to maximize the number of items that you get which you might have been what you were saying there with the quantity. But it's kind of crazy how that works. Like, it's very unintuitive. So with Pilgrim's Haven, you know, you're going to get sapphires and iron shards and a platinum ore and a piece of coal. And there's just so much crap that you get out there that it's just, it's the fastest gathering in the game. It's, it's fantastic. So uh, right now, you don't gather without lucky tools, right? You know that, hopefully. Um, I try to gather with whatever I have, honestly. Oh, really? Okay. It's really bad, yeah. Yeah, don't ever do that anymore. So only gather with Lucky or Magic. Uh, but fortunately, you know enough in the game and you have other activities like Imperial or grinding or farming that you know you don't have to be hard pressed to gather until your tools are ready. So uh, start just mass producing tools. This is something you probably want to do in Calpheon as well. And uh, I think steel is the way to go because shining steel it's going to cost maybe 100 150k in order to produce them once you're going to have to produce between 15 and 20 tools in order to get a lucky on average so it's generally a lot better a lot just more cost effective to just mass produce the steel tools and throw away anything that isn't lucky now because lucky and magic are going to basically almost double how much money you're making per gathering you could get away with spending two to three million per shining lucky tool. That is something you could do. And uh, that would cut down your gathering time from three seconds to two seconds. So it wouldn't be a mistake. Just choose what you want your upfront cost to be and then go that route. I've, I typically go steel, um, but either one is, is fine. 
so that's something you don't have to do like immediately today or this week or next week but this is part of your long-term empire strategies so one of the things i've learned from just playing this game since 2016 is that this game is an event-based economy and they will every once in a while be like hey when you gather you're gonna get you know all these crazy things and to have an account established so 17 characters have artisan one gathering you will actually be able to crank out just continuous top end silver uh indefinitely with a camisil buff you know even your main might eventually run out even with villa buffs and stuff like that but having all of the access and all of your your alts with max energy or i'm sorry not max energy with high gathering levels Depending on what the events could be, you might be able to just crank out 100 million an hour, just, you know, non-stop. So it's something that you should probably just work on in the long term. So then once your work, or not your workers, but your, uh, your alts are pretty much between that artisan master level, you just start parking in the other location, so then if I wanted to gather, I could just... Exactly. Yeah, then it would just be a part of yeah your main gathering thing. I would stop at Artisan 1 out in Pilgrim's Haven because that's when you're going to be able to get four procs from things like Pine Sap or Bloods or Meats or whatever it is that you're trying to get. Those base mats will be at an all-time high. But I think that's where the sweet spot is. And it will take some time. I still have a couple characters that I think are Professional 10 that still need to be cranked over to Artisan. But, uh, you know, it's fantastic right now. And it's only going to get better with Manos. So that's one of the things where if you put in the time, that'll give you such a leg up over other players. All right, let's see. Uh, let's talk about your farming character right now. So we went over a couple different things to farm. Oh, are you using organic fertilizer? Uh, I'm using, I think it's organic, yeah. Okay, so that cuts down your crop time by 20%. That's good. So usually, like every step of the way, I have to teach people each individual thing here, but I'm glad you have a lot of this background knowledge already. And I forgot awesome. to tell you, it, my old uh, artisan ten farming. <laughs> That's I'm great. Almost, almost the master, so I get oh, the whole there you go. That's cool. All right. Do you know about the min max energy method? It's some crazy video I came up with three years ago. Is you ever heard of that, or not really? exactly okay so you are familiar that's an insane method right oh you don't even need to that's okay that's what this coaching is for you don't have to rewatch it i'll just go over it again so when i use an alt for farming that means i'm not on it enough for the energy to come back so i have a lot of issues with just maintaining the energy um i imagine so you're using magic plants rather than special so you have only 20 things to to basically breed and all that and prune and stuff like that so it probably won't be as bad so this isn't something that i'm even suggesting but i do want you to be aware of it in case you run into these issues it will be having to buy energy potions or you know just afking on your alt so essentially if you just buy something well your farms are north of logia farm right yeah okay cool yep sunniest place fastest grow time so if you just buy one of these little logia farm houses right there get a residence throw a pearl bed in there. I've actually had a pearl bed just kind of in my pearl inventory. So as I'm wandering around, if I need to just buy a residence and throw it down there, I can crank out some extra energy. But uh, just having that there, if you just look at when your energy tick ticks over, it'll happen exactly three minutes after that. And then whatever action your character is doing is what determines how much energy you get. So if you're standing and farming, you get one energy, or you know, if you have a camisole buff, you get three energy. And if you're laying down at the instant of that tick, you get an extra two points of energy. So for farming especially, and more importantly on an alt, you can just be out there, you can just do all that stuff for about two minutes, 30 seconds, run back into your residence, hop into bed, and get an extra two points of energy. It's just something to be aware if you find yourself kind of energy starved on a character like that. But I'm really glad you've already seen the video and already aware of the method, so just one thing to, to keep in mind. Alrighty, let's see. Moving on. Uh, so you had some trace of origin. Are those pretty much going through Grim Reaper elixirs right now, or where are you using um, those? I actually nuked a lot of it. I had nuked. 10, yes, I. Uh, That's scary. I had almost ten thousand uh, traces of origin. I had paid up. 
Oh and god. Oh, that's perfect, dude. That's the best use ever. So I, I was like, you know, all the stuff is back fine. I'm not, I'm just gonna just burn it. That's great. Yeah. Okay. When you said you nuked it, dude, you horrified no, me no, there. No, yeah. No, I didn't sell the market. Okay. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. That scared me. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah, I would just make sure that all your origins are going through the Grim Reaper, and then you take that through to the drafts. So, it's amazing how profitable drafts are. And now you know the math to see if you can just make some extra profit without any alchemy. Uh, I'm really happy that you're doing Imperials. That's one of the main things to keep in mind with your interval income. Just things that can't be done indefinitely, but just stuff to, you know, stay on top of as he has the opportunity. So it looks like you're making tea with fine scent, um, honey wine, and you have a third, third box in there. What's the other one that you're making? Um, I have like omelets. Oh, omelets. Yeah. I okay. Fried fish. I That's a good one. And then whatever I have left over, I'll use like sturdy elixir so I, I kind of do half mm -hmm. and half i know some people say oh you gotta do whatever but i just try to get all my cp usage mm -hmm. out of the way and then i'm just getting money and i don't really care honestly so that's dude that's perfect i think you're doing it right i think that's the absolute way to go like you said yeah a lot of people try to maximize getting the most amount of silver per day but rather if you're just all of these things that you're doing are really good ways of expanding how much profit you can get per uh, ingredient there so I think if you mix and match them and just clock them out per day that's that's really good dude you're one of the most efficient players I've run into already uh, so two fine cents just 30 alchemy boxes was the one that I wanted to make sure you were aware of now do you make your own worker elixirs or are you buying them um, everything that I own I pretty much crafted I never really had to wow. buy anything off the market I, everything wow. I own is I crafted Okay, well I think that's actually where we're going to improve your efficiency the most, simply because if you're taking the time to craft one thing, your opportunity cost is the next best thing you're giving up. And so while you might be a master, you know, like jack of all trades kind of thing, by spending your times on certain activities you're missing generally a higher profit thing. So with worker elixirs, those are a loss, those are a loss to make even if you're going out and gathering the blood you could be making more money through kafir's gathering like lumber or pilgrim's haven stuff so i would cut worker elixirs out of your routine entirely but put it onto your marketing routine because people sell them it's amazing so if you look at worker elixirs uh there's 600 on the market right now for eight to nine k so at the price of 15 to 16,000 is when it's not really effective to buy them anymore and you should maybe think about producing them again but uh, right now, yeah, that's... So I always buy as many worker elixirs as I can. And then I'll make the Fisher elixirs because as you already know, you know, if you're gathering the bloods, you're making your own wise men blood, you're making Fisher elixirs, you take that into sturdy. That's a really effective way to go. Yep. How many alchemy seals do you have right now? Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> another another awesome check mark, dude. That's fantastic. So as you know, you need a bunch of those for mana. So you want to just make sure that you're getting those continued alchemy turn-ins ready for that. But if you're sitting at three thousand, I think that's that's basically where you need to be. All right. Yeah, I, I, I saw that the mana was required, so I stopped using them and just mm -hmm. started saving the seals. Cool, pretty impressive. I'm gonna keep looking over my notes here. I have a handful of things that I want to talk to you about, but do you have any questions so far? Um, so about farming, mm -hmm. is it bad to have workers work on them? No, that's fine. No, that's okay. Uh, probably not something you'd need to if you can't check your, your farms every three and a half hours. It's really nice to have workers on them if you can like routinely go back and then at 100% or 105%, you're always breeding them and you're placing them down again. So workers make sure that you don't have any kind of delays. But if you're working all day and sometimes you check your farms after four hours and sometimes after six hours, whether or not they were pruned by workers doesn't really make a big difference. Okay. Um, one of the ways, if you just find yourself enjoying farming, one of the ways to, I wouldn't say it increases your silver per hour much more, but it keeps you at a consistent, very, very high silver per hour I would ballpark over 50 million per hour by just doing farming longer. And the way to do that would be 
a hundred of the special plants, pruning them yourself so that you get more mysterious seeds. And then when you plant mysterious seeds, you always get between three and four fruits. So if each one of these fruits is making 2.5 oils and each one of these oils is making 2.5 of the green elixirs with a 30% chance of making blue elixirs, we already did the value on those. It's just a fantastic way, if you really like farming, to just invest more time into it and consistently get more profit out of it. But I wouldn't say it goes so far as increases your silver per hour over magical seeds. So right now you have it as a very like low time investing farming thing uh, while you do everything else in the game, and I think that's fine. But if you wanted to alter it, then I still prefer the special seeds because I, I love getting mysterious seeds out of it. Uh, another thing that's just kind of useful to note with those is if you do it that way and you kind of stockpile mysterious seeds, you can continue to batch those seeds and just have them for like a rainy day basically. Uh, so for me, what I did was I think I had several hundred of those seeds which allowed me to produce um, over a thousand fruits right before the central market happened. So I was like, okay, you know, my warehouses have this good stockpile, I'm gonna take a couple days, I'm gonna plant all mysterious seeds, and I was able to get thousands of those fruits, which created more thousands of oils, over 10,000s of these uh, bottleneck elixirs that all went into drafts. And because I had a good market swing there with the central market, that allowed me to take advantage of that in a huge way. So it's not too bad to, to farm in a different way as well. Putting workers on there and <laughs> ruin it and stuff, but no, it's, a, it's okay. I'm actively doing stuff whenever I'm either not working or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's nice to where I can see when it flashes on my screen, and I know I can immediately swap and just attend to it, reset it, and then go back to my grinding, whatever I'm doing. Right, that makes sense. Does it even flash on your screen? I don't think I've even noticed that. It's funny. <laughs> Usually I glow yellow on it, like runs 100%. Cool, okay. Uh, let's see. You said you have, what, three, was it 340 CP? Good, exactly. 342 now. 42, that's pretty great, man. Um, so you don't have the 10 node, which is north of Old Dandelion, Old Dandelion Karudu Cave. That's a pretty good one to have. Do you have any spare CP right now, or are we going to have to unroot a couple things? Might have to unroot a few things. Okay. Alright, I can save you one CP with your connection to O's Pass. So I like that you have a lot of the timbers. You have the cedar down around Trent. I think that's fantastic. You have the fir and tree and forest. So you have the fir and mancha forest. You also have the trace of violence out of mancha. That's a really good way to go. Any of the timbers that you can grab of any kind is a good thing to have. Because in the future, we're going to have manos processing. We're going to be able to process through that in huge batches. And even if you're not making a huge amount of crates, you can basically sell them for some of the better profit. So keep all those timbers, keep the birch that you have. Did a really good job there. So O's Pass, though. Um, if you end up, what worker do you have on O's Pass? It's a little bit north of Keplin. It's a cedar node. Okay, that's not too bad. How are your workers out of Keplin? Do you only have one good one, or what's the deal there? Uh, Keplin, they're all just artists and giants, and he's just on that, uh, that Keplin quarry node. Well, that's not bad. So you have multiple? Perfect. Um, yeah, I have, I have... I have three artists and giants at Keplin. Oh, good. Okay. So right now you're connected through uh, Falrez Dirt Farm, and then you've got the node in between that with O's Pass. So the Fall Res Dirt Farm is a two contribution node, uh, which you won't need for any other connection. Whereas the two between Keplin Quarry, you've got North Abandoned Quarry and O's House. Each one of those is one CP. So I would actually send the worker up from Keplin to go to O's Pass rather than from West and Calpheon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'll be a one contribution shortcut there. I like the nodes you have around Velia, they're all pretty good. You have the Grape node outside of Olvia. 
Uh, that's another case where the workload is about 100. So if you can get a perfectly rolled giant, you can cycle them over between 12 and 15 minutes rather than half an hour. Even after years, I'm still trying to get the perfect giant on that thing. It's kind of annoying. Yeah, no, I know the struggle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this is all fairly good. Okay. So next week, we'll probably go over just additional workshops, profits, the state of the market right there. I kind of want to talk to you more about cooking and the profit from cron meals. And uh, we can maybe tear up a few more nodes and try to optimize that a little bit. But um, yeah, how do you feel this has gone so far? It was very eye-opening. It actually feels good that I'm actually doing good. Cool, man. I'm kind of like, messing up already, so it's just good to hear from your perspective on what I'm doing. All right, It'll be good to hear uh, good your stuff. perspective for cooking because I have no knowledge on cooking outside of just making beer and just... just really? For everything. Everything that I got from my cooking level is just basically Wow, dude. I had no idea. Looking at your, your banks here, it looks like you had some pretty good stuff. And I've got a good page of cooking information, but I'm looking and I'm like, all right, I can't tell much in two minutes, so I guess we'll just make that the second session. What Before you, the system yeah. market changed, I was thinking of making meals, but then I was just like, oh my god, milk. <laughs> right. So the milk was... I didn't even attempt to try it to see if I could manage milk, so I kind of just scared myself away before even trying it. Right, that makes sense. What's crazy is you can buy milk on the market now, and it actually yeah. works out in a lot of the other recipes. So the central market has really helped out because basically the prices and the profits and the costs all pretty much equalize. And in a, a super competitive market like this, it makes it so that you can produce items for the most, for the least amount of cost. And for buying items, you can get it at the best price. So it milk actually doesn't become as much of a bottleneck because there can be profit in simply buying a lot of the bottlenecks uh, rather than making them yourself. But uh, we'll we'll hold off and we'll have like a pretty good session next week because there's a lot of good stuff with cooking, dude. It's fantastic. Um, but going over a little bit more with alchemy. So does it make sense that you know shy away from making your own work elixirs? Uh, do you remember the math on the on the beast and giant drafts? I want you to at least start looking at maybe just buying those components if they're profitable and start cranking out some like super high AFK income. Yep, I could just re, uh, re add the current market values and see if it's still above. All right, okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, from the blue will elixirs and the blue perforation elixirs, uh, those guys right there would be what you would look for to get the most amount of profit. Whereas if those two blue things weren't on the market right now for those prices, it really wouldn't be worth it. Cause it's not, your profit is gone if you have to buy the green will elixirs, for example, and the green perforation kind of eat up some of your profit as well. But as long as those two blue things are on the market, it's generally worthwhile to buy those and then buy the other uh, corresponding components. Uh, do you have any questions on any kind of traces or other things that you're making with Alchemy since we're kind of focused on that today? I guess if I was wanting to make anything else, I have to almost essentially buy weapons off the market and then melt them down. You mean to get the traces? Yes. <laughs> so it's just, I'm just always sitting at a central market buying weapons and just melting. I just don't know if that's proficient. Are you getting like white horn bows or what do you mean? Or iron weapons or what, what are we talking here? Uh, I was I was doing violence. Oh, okay. I did make the, the perforation stuff. Mm -hmm. Because I can't really just wait on my node. Yeah, really that's a very fruit. slow one for sure. Yeah, and you find that traces are almost more of a bottleneck than fruit sometimes. I forget that I ended up buying like 20k trace of violence when they were 10k a piece, so I'm still sitting on quite a pile there. I'll have to get the fruits for later. But, uh, you know, things like Trace of Savagery, that's still very profitable going through metal solvents, and those are really cheap on the market. Uh, if you're going your Carnage rate, I think Trace of Earth is still pretty cheap on PC. Let me double check that. Earth here. Uh, well, actually, 20k. It's not that cheap. 
But all right, so for workshops, we'll hit it more next week, but um, why don't you set up two different workshops? So just do basic um, horseshoes and then do the light horseshoes. So things that require the um, powder of earth and then the standard powder of crevice. Each one of those are pretty good. Basic steel. Mm -hmm. Or, well, let's see, steel horseshoe and the, oh wow. Yeah, scratch the light horseshoe, that doesn't really work anymore. Uh, just do some steel combat horseshoes and just have your worker just kind of churn it out. I think with a heavy farm system, you don't really need to have workshops. You've really got a good system already with Imperials, farming, gathering, grinding, worker nodes. You don't really need it. And there isn't, there aren't like a ton of crazy opportunities right now with profit but okay. uh, rather than the light horseshoe since I don't like the margins on that I made something like uh, crafting costumes and steel horseshoes those are relatively low CP intensive things that you could do if you'd like to if not it's really you're not really missing much okay that, that's actually nice just because I know there's some people out there that say oh, well, if you don't have your workshop running 24 7 and <laughs> Yeah, it's just an alternative way to play. Also, right now, Grunel is a loss, <laughs> so you can just laugh at them. So it would be more effective if you went out there, if like people gathered all those hides and processed them, it would be more effective for them just to sell all the components of Grunel rather than make it, so. All right, man, well, uh, yeah, this has been pretty good. I think we should meet in about seven days and um, we'll really hit cooking hard because that is, that's something that I mean, we could probably have like five hours on that, to be honest, but I'll condense it all and show you guys, show you exactly where the profit is, because there's some amazing things on NA right now. Well, that sounds good. Well, I enjoy this hour. Good. Glad to hear it. Cool, man. And you got your notes, hopefully? Yes, sir. All right, good stuff. And I'm still available on Twitter or Discord if you have any questions along the way. Cool, sounds good. All right, man. I'll talk to you in a week.